Good morning to all our viewers or good evening, uh, depending on who, where you are in the world. So this is the first session of track three of the Bristol Robotics Lab Conference. And today with us uh, to start and kick off the, uh, the session, we have Dr. Matthew Studley, who is the Walscourt Associate Professor of Technology Ethics at the University of the West of England. His current projects include benchmarking robotics, public engagement, robots in smart cities, and drones for inspection and maintenance. So with that, I'm going to pass over to, to Matt. Sorry about that. So, so Matt, please take it away. Uh, right. And hopefully we can hear you now, yeah. Thank you very much, Antonia. So, hello everybody, um, viewers out there in internet land. So I'm going to talk briefly this morning about two topics. One is ethical foresight analysis, and the other one is the CYROC project. Um, and these two topics are linked in a way because they both concern our desire to get the good and avoid the bad, and in particular, in connection with robotics and AI. So the way I want to start today is by giving you this quote from E.O. Wilson, the famous uh, biologist. He said, the real problem of humanity is the following. We have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. Now, the fundamental problem is that our emotions, the way that we make decisions, remains the same. It's hardwired into us. A lot of our um, ability to think and the sorts of thoughts we can have is determined by an evolutionary process which is um, essentially long finished. Um, but our technology continues to advance and it advances faster and faster. So given that we want to avoid the bad stuff and get the good stuff, how are we going to, how are we going to do this? Um, if we're looking at a future technology, we've got a bit of a problem. New technologies are very hard to predict because they're um, in posse, not in essay. They, they don't exist at the moment. So we can't look at them in the world and comment on them and comment on their ethics. We need to speculate about them. This makes it hard, but very clearly, the earlier we try to engage in ethical questions about a technology, the better. Because the earlier we do it, the more traction we have um, in trying to change the shape and um, future path of a technology. The next problem that we might have is that global markets might bring us in touch with many different stakeholders who have different interests and ethical frames. So when I talk about ethical frames, what I mean really is the way that we understand what good is, because we often talk about ethics um, as, uh, for example, maximizing good, minimizing bad, but we seldom explicitly stop to say, well, what is good? Now, my good is hard to express. I don't know what your good is. You might be coming from a different culture to me or um, at a different time. Now, this is another important thing because our definition of good is dynamic. It changes with time. And in the UK over the last um, 50 years or so, we've seen a big shift in the way that we view the morality or ethics of different topics, such as unmarried mothers or homosexuality or animal rights. And so our moral frame, our ethical frame, is a dynamic thing which changes with time and, of course, is in uh, feedback with the technology and society in which it operates. And furthermore, of course, there are many different cultural frames which we need to consider. So the Chinese ethics of technology is in part um, largely similar, as far as I can make out, to um, a Western ethics of technology. The Islamic ethics of technology is um, an emerging discipline. But um, these different ethics may be subtly different from uh, a Western approach. Um, and of course, we need to consider them, at least in some part, because the way in which our technologies might be used and the places where they might be used may touch on different people with different frames. Now, next, the other problem is that it's very difficult to talk about the ethics of a technology, but we can talk about the ethics of applications of this technology. We can talk about the artifacts which are 
being created, and these will either be physical products or processes. And each new artifact will require new assessment. So we can't just hope to assess the ethics of robotics and AI. We have to do this every time we roll something out, every time we consider a new product. And the other unfortunate problem is that the consequences of getting it wrong, or indeed getting it right, grow with the profundity of the technology. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, well, to give you an example of a technology which I think is truly profound, let's talk about AI and robotics. So where could we apply AI? Where could we apply robotics? We could apply it more or less everywhere. Um, everything that we do can, we, can be done smarter. So AI, we could say, is a technology which could be almost universally applied. Now, those of you who work within the field will be aware that we can't really talk about AI as a technology. It's a whole host of different emerging techniques which we can apply to different problems. Um, but I think that the problems which we might have from AI and robotics are certainly not going to be things like Skynet or Terminator. They're not going to be um, uh, malevolent consciousnesses. In fact, I think the main problems which we're going to have are going to be much more subtle than that. So, for example, if we talk about using AI for decision support, then actually what we're doing is we're in some part doing decision replacement. We're offloading our moral responsibility um, and placing it on a machine. And this is um, a, quite a subtle process. If the machine tells us that an important decision should go one way rather than our gut decision, our emotional decision, that it should go another, then um, we would have to be very brave to go against the recommendations of the AI. After all, the AI is building these decisions on data which are too complex for us to understand directly. And if we do say, I'm not doing what the machine tell, tells me, I'm going to go with my experience and we get it wrong, then uh, you know, the fault is clearly ours. The next problem I think that we have is the familiar problem of garbage in, garbage out. Now, we're, of course, familiar with the idea that, uh, that if we were to feed a corrupt or biased data set to uh, an artificial intelligence, then um, the quality of its decision making would be compromised by that. Um, but if you look at the picture on this play on this page, you'll see a series of illustrations which were created by um, an AI process called DAL-E, um, which analyzes online images and then uses them as inspiration to create new images. So these images here are a snail made of a harp or um, a snail with the texture of a harp. Now, I would imagine that the way that this has been created is that we have a bunch of, uh, a bunch of input data that has been manually, um, originally manually tagged as snails and harps. And that tagging process, that process of semantic assignment has been done by humans. Um, and then the output of the AI is something which could also be tagged as snails and harps. So now a future process that's looking for snails or looking for harps will find this data. And gradually, the more we do this, the more truth becomes lost. The next sort of problem that we have is particularly in connection with um, robotics. So um, those of you who work in robotics will be familiar with the idea that uh, if we have anthropomorphic machines that we will tend to treat them in the same way, using the same neuronal machinery, the same evolved machinery, as we treat other human beings. And this could lead us into what I might term category errors. So for example, if I have a robot that appears to be human in its behavior or in its um, form in the home, should I treat it as a human or should I treat it as a machine? Either way seems fraught. If I treat it as a human, will this cause me to treat other humans as machines? If I treat it without respect, will this cause me to treat other humans with less respect? Um, there are very clear problems 
in the way that we relate to each other as a result of this. Another problem which could arise, and I'll touch upon this in my next talk about um, the CYROC challenge, is that robots and robotic technology allow us to put sensors everywhere, sensors where um, sensors were not planned because robots are sensing platforms and this sensory information could be reused. So ultimately the challenges that we have are to very basic human um, concepts such as privacy or trust or law or even truth. How will we make decisions? How will we make good decisions when the sea of information that we swim in is um, full of garbage? I mean, pollution in the sea is obviously a physical problem. It's an informational problem as well, metaphorically speaking. Um, so there are a bunch of different ways that we can approach this. Um, we can use a variety of approaches which have been labeled ex ante approaches, that is that um, we can do them before we engage in a process of development. And there's uh, an excellent paper by uh, Floridian Strait, which provides an overview of a variety of different approaches. I won't go into these now because time is short. But they tend to be iterative. Um, they tend to carry on throughout the process of the project. Um, they tend to be based on discourse with stakeholder groups. So we need to find out who will be affected, the individuals and the groups that will be affected by a particular technology and talk to them about their desires um, and uh, the things that they would want to avoid. And some of them explicitly deal with the fact that we have changing moral landscapes. But there's an overhead, of course. So they add cost and they may add time to a project. Um, and in a commercial environment, this could be a disincentive for us to use them. They also require significant buy-in at um, the highest level within an organization, because if we're going to engage with something that could make our product less competitive, we need to be sure that this is worthwhile doing. Now, I would argue that it is absolutely worth doing. And I'll touch on the reasons why shortly. But um, as an illustration of this recently, I interacted with a group uh, and I won't mention anything about the work that they're doing and I won't mention anything about them. But suffice it to say that when I heard about what they intended, the first thing that I thought about was this is an ethical minefield. Um, and the uh, response which I saw from them um, uh, was roughly, we'll worry about the ethics when we've done the development. Uh, this worries me. So here's the carrot for engaging in um, uh, ethical foresight analysis. There's an explosion of interest. It's obvious that um, amongst the academic community and amongst members of the public as well, that there's an increase in concern about the impacts of AI and robotics and other emerging technologies. We've seen this, for example, um, in public reactions to GM foods. We've seen an increase in ethical consumerism in people using the power of their um, buying and their money in order to change um, commercial behavior. We've also seen a rise in ethical investment where people are choosing um, the investment vehicles for their uh, wealth based upon not just the financial return, but also the societal or environmental return as well. And I would suggest to you that if we get this right, then we as a, an organization, as a company, um, or as a product, we can flourish. The advantages of um, baking ethics in um, are that we can improve company reputation, that a company can retain its top talent. There's significant um, uh, research which suggests that if the ethics of the organization do not align with the ethics of its uh, employees, that these employees are disincentivized and may leave and go elsewhere. And finally, of course, we limit risk and we hopefully increase value. And here's the stick. This is why we need to get this right. This is um, Robert Oppenheimer talking about his work on the atomic bomb tests. He knew the world 
world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. So I hope that that was um, uh, that was visible to you. It looked like it might have been a bit laggy to me. The point I'd like to make is that atomic bombs are easy to ethically assess. Um, we could say that the technology itself is unethical, although, of course, at the time in the Second World War, there seemed to be a very good reason and arguments can be made about um, the value of atomic bombs and the number of lives that might have been saved in shortening the war. But as a technology, fundamentally, atomic bombs exist with one purpose, and that's to cause massive uh, loss of life and environmental destruction. Now, other technologies are more difficult to assess. So um, our process needs to be good and it needs to be robust. Um, now, the bad news is that there is no easy go-to reference for how to do ethical foresight analysis. There are, there's lots of writing about it, and I'm actually engaged um, with uh, a, a very large uh, engineering consultancy company at the moment, working on just this process of how we will develop uh, ethical foresight analysis and apply it to a variety of different emerging technology problems. But I would um, be very grateful and uh, eager if you have problems and you want to apply this and you get in touch with me and I can help you because I think the consequences are of us applying these technologies and getting it wrong are fundamentally bad, but the offer of benefit is tremendous. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt. That was a fascinating talk. Very, very interesting and uh, very powerful. Uh, the end as well with the video. Um, could I ask uh, uh, if you have any questions, please make sure that you put it in the comments so we can see. Uh, so while we wait for any uh, questions, um, I have one. So, um, so based on what you said just now at the end of your presentation, uh, say that a company wants to implement ethical foresight analysis, uh, where, how, how do they start? Um, okay, so I think the best place to start is with the um, Floridian Strait paper from 2020. Another good place to look for insight and inspiration is uh, some of the online publications from the Turing Institute. Um, but like I said at the end of the talk, there is, there's no, um, as far as I have found, there's no handbook which will walk you through this process. And so um, you will need to develop this process for yourself. Uh, and I hope that this is one of the things which we can offer as a lab. It's certainly something which I'm tremendously keen to help develop. Yes, that's great. And, and, and can you give maybe an example of how this sort of process um, shaped investment decisions? Yeah, yeah. So I've got a, I've got a good example of that. Um, so a few years ago, I was lucky enough to be involved in a project with the um, which was um, funded by uh, and initiated by the Swiss military. Um, so what they wanted to do was they wanted to understand how they would do an ethical analysis of lethal or non-lethal autonomous weapon systems. And their reason for this, I think it was very interesting. So. Switzerland has a, a participatory democracy based upon referenda. And Swiss citizens 
can um, offer suggestions for referenda. And if a sufficient number of citizens believe that it is a concern, then they can collectively vote on it. And the results of their vote have to be enacted by the Swiss parliament. So the Swiss military then wanted to know, how can we assess the ethics of autonomous systems for the military? Because if we buy, if we invest in systems, potentially at the cost of billions of dollars, and then the public turn around and say, you can't use this anymore, then it's simply wasted investment. So I particularly liked this example. It's, um, uh, and it's, it's an example of an ethically driven process coming from a very unusual source, but very clearly based around um, a return on investment. Thank you. Okay, so um, uh, there's there's a few comments in, in the chat. Uh, uh, people are thanking you for the talk and they agree with you that is really, really important. Um, shall we go now to the next presentation uh, opportunity for more questions at the end of the second presentation? So while you're changing maybe your slides, uh, if you can either unshare what you have and then share the new ones. Sure. Um, in the meantime, I'll just uh, introduce myself briefly, which I didn't do in the beginning for the sake of time. Uh, my name is Antonia Zemonaki. I'm a, a lecturer in robotics at the University of Bristol and, of course, a member of the Bristol Robotics Lab. Okay, Antonia. Um, so, I... I'll just share this. Now, as I was mm -hmm. reading the presentation, uh, PowerPoint helpfully informed me that there might be some security violation with external content, which has never come up before. So there's a video embedded in it, which may or may not run. Um, if it doesn't run, I'll share the URL because it's a resource which is on YouTube. Yeah, and I will post it in the comments. Okay, I can see the presentation now. So I'll pass it over to you. Okay, thank you, Antonia, once again. Um, so now, moving on, I want to talk to you about a project which I'm leading, which is called CyRock. So, so CyRock is a uh, a European, a European Union Horizon 2020 uh, research and community support action project. And it exists in order to further and develop the European Robotics League. So the European Robotics League is a, a network of competitions that take place throughout Europe, consisting of three categories. There's consumer robots, so the sorts of robots which we might buy or which might operate in the home. Professional robots, which would be, we used to call this industrial robot, but we realized that the um, convergence of industrial robotics with um, cobots and uh, consumer robotics with service robots um, meant that actually these two distinctions were starting to become one of uh, area of application rather than area of technology. Um, and emergency robots, so these might be robots which are um, uh, uh, working in emergency situations at land, air or sea uh, in order to assist people or report on the situation. But the reason why CYROC and the ERL is different from other robotics competitions is that our aim is benchmarking through competition. So there's a scientific purpose in the work that we do. Teams come along, they have fun, they test their robots, and then they learn um, through these benchmark trials about how different functional components or different robot systems perform on a variety of tasks. But the problem with the ERL as it stood was that these competitions often took place in labs or at robotics conferences. So our ability to engage with the public was limited. So the CYROC project brings the robot competitions 
into smart cities. Some of you might be unfamiliar with the concept of smart cities. So the idea of smart cities is that cities can have sensors distributed around them in order to perceive their environment at, in real time. They have processing in order to use this sensory information and other data inputs in order to uh, make decisions. And then they can affect their environment by um, supporting services, uh, switching on and off traffic lights, etc., in order to respond to emergencies or in order to um, enable uh, the provision of services within the city, which would be difficult or impossible without this information. So given that a city senses its environment, makes decisions based upon this, and has the capacity to change its environment, a smart city seems very much like a robot. And the offer, the data offer, and the added value of these sensors make the smart city seem like a natural home for a robot. But there might be lots of benefits and drawbacks of this. As I mentioned in my previous talk, um, if we treat robots as being mobile sensor platforms, um, then we, would, we will find ourselves um, under surveillance or with the capacity to be under surveillance through the majority of our lives from a, a, a whole variety of different um, platforms. There'll be mobile drones flying through the air which are um, picking up information about not only about their environment so that they can navigate, but also about the people and the cars which are underneath them. One thing which we observed is that most of the use cases of robots in smart cities will fall into the categories of the ERL. And so this seemed like a good opportunity. Um, but not just a good opportunity for us to test out robots in an interesting new context using the data from cities, but also an opportunity to engage in something which is really fundamentally important. So most people are going to live in cities by 2050, most of the people of the world. Cities are gonna have a huge impact on our lives. Um, they will be the place where we most often meet robots and interact with robots. And what we've been trying to do is to put robots and our robotic competitions in the center of cities, in the center of smart cities, so that people can see the state of the art. And I think that this is tremendously important because what I think we don't want to do is to simply leave robotic development and AI development up to the vagaries of market forces. I think we need to put citizens in the driving seat. So what we're doing in CyRoc is we're demoing robots in relatable um, and believable contexts so that people can see them. And we're doing this with a whole host of other talks and engagement opportunities so that we can give people facts about robots, about the state of the art, so that they can make judgments about what they want and what they don't want based upon real fact and not based upon things which they may have seen in science fiction. This is tremendously important. Collectively, we need to decide what sort of future do we want. So we've done one of these events already. Um, the CyRoc competition in 2019 was held in Milton Keynes. Um, and we had teams from all over Europe who brought their robots to compete in a series of episodes, which um, are, for example, delivering coffee in a coffee shop or um, other challenges, which to members of the public might seem really easy, opening a door, for example, but which um, within the field of robotics, we know, are quite hard, uh, particularly for a, a bipedal robot, but hard enough for any robot. Um, and the difficulty arises because the world is a complex, noisy space where there's a lot going on, a variety of different lighting conditions, a variety of different door handles, and doors which open in different directions. Um, actually interacting and doing things that people find easy can be very difficult for a robot. And this is very useful for people to see. We believe that we may have been seen by about 650,000 people 
with our event, which was right in the heart of Milton Keynes, um, at a point where many people um, walk from one side of Milton Keynes to another. We were right in the middle of um, one of the largest shopping centers in Europe. And all of our sponsors reported to us that they had gained value in um, access to potential employees because these robotics um, students, PhD students taking part, are some of the brightest and most able in Europe. Uh, reputational advantage, particularly in the case of Milton Keynes, the city itself, seeking to attract high tech industry and investment, and also media attention. So hopefully I can now show you a brief video. Um, and if this doesn't work, then um, I'll share the link in uh, the comments. another event this September. It's going to take place in Bologna. Uh, Bologna was chosen after we had a, a, an open competition process where a number of smart cities bid to host the next event. And um, it will take place in um, one of the historic buildings that's in the centre of Bologna, which uh, is and, and in association with the University of Bologna, which is the oldest university in Europe. The theme of this year's event is smart inclusion. So we're gonna use the data of the Bologna platform and interact with robots in order to demonstrate a whole bunch of stuff. So we're gonna have humanoids shopping. We're going to have drones delivering emergency medication, which of course is very relatable given the pandemic experience that we've all had. We're going to have sign language communication in order to open robots and technology to an, another part of the community and other things as well. So for those um, corporate uh, viewers, if you're interested in being a sponsor, we still have a few slots left. Um, you can visit our website for details or contact me directly at matthew2.studley at uwe.ac.uk. And beyond 2021, our vision is to um, sustain this um, even beyond the CIROC project. So uh, the European Commission has had few projects which have been sustainable once the funding has been switched off. Um, and we're hoping to be one of these. So we're working together with EU Robotics um, and in association with Spark, which is the public private um, initiative, uh, joining together the robotics industry, uh, academic community and um, government in Europe. In order to have an ongoing biennial event, and our vision is that this will grow so that we pull together um, other projects as well, not just robotics, but also AI. Um, and this becomes a sort of moving um, festival of science which every two years will take part in a different um, smart city throughout Europe. And I hope in this way, we'll be able to engage with the public and the public will be able to shape policy in cities where they live and throughout Europe. Um, so uh, thank you all very much. And um, do get in touch if you want further information. The competition is taking place in Bologna this September. Full information is available on our website. Um, and as I said, for corporate sponsors, we have a few slots left um, and always need more money. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Matt, fascinating talk again. It was very impressive when you mentioned there were hundreds of thousands of people that were basically that basically experienced or viewed um, the, the, this this competition. So, the, so the people of of Milton Keynes, what did they think about it? Did you get to interact with them or get any feedback from them? Did they were they impressed? Yeah, so Milton Keynes is an interesting place because uh, the people in Milton Keynes feel in many cases that they're familiar with robots already. Um, for those of you who haven't been to Milton Keynes, I recommend a trip. It's far more exciting than I thought it was going to be. It's a, it's, it's a very interesting place. And they've had robots working, delivering um, food in Milton Keynes for some years now with Starship robots, um, which you can dial into an app or a website and order some items to be delivered to your home. Um, they've also had robots working in their local library. And we did some, um, we got some feedback from people using a, a questionnaire and reported on this um, in the scientific literature. Uh, the, the people of Milton Keynes on the whole are tremendously optimistic about the opportunities and services which robots can bring to them. But the place where they worry is, as you might imagine, um, where they see that a human touch is particularly needed. So they would be very unkeen on, um, for example, the police being replaced or augmented by robots. Uh, and I have to admit that I agree wholeheartedly with their analysis there. Um, the other thing that they're less keen on of course, is uh, is private organisations having information about them, and they have much more faith in local government having information about them. And this, of course, is um, stems from worries about the way in which your information might be used or, or might be abused. So these issues of information privacy and transparency are going to be increasingly important as we move towards um, smart city infrastructure. That's great, thank you. Um, so I have another question. Um, earlier in your talk, you mentioned that there are dropout, drawbacks in, for robots, so having robots in, in smart cities, as you define them. And, and you did mention some examples, but can you tell us more about this? Is there a special challenge or uh, something more uh, specific that you have in mind? What with um, the interaction of robots with smart cities? Yes, uh, I mean, you mentioned drawbacks. So so what is the really the challenge that you see there? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so uh, the particular ethical challenges um, with robots in smart cities are likely to arise through, uh, well, both through unforeseen interactions and in the literature, we've already seen some explorations of the way that um, different robots with different privacy, different sensors and different um, uh, access privileges can be used together in order to mount um, attacks which are um, which no single robot can perform. Um, so if we're taking data from one platform or from one robot or environment and reusing it in another way, then I think this is where the particular problems will arise. So, for example, um, we can see how privacy can be violated um, by having data in depth. And this will be familiar to people who um, are familiar with uh, the sort of uh, GDPR or around the ethics of you know, research ethics and data. So we can imagine that we've anonymized data by removing any direct reference to people's names or addresses. Um, and, uh, you know, on Google Earth, we could anonymize information by um, removing car number plates or by pixelating people's faces. But if we have a sufficient amount of data, and if this data concerns the dynamics of people's movements, so we see from one sensor that a person wearing a particular color top walks past one point and then we see from another sensor that a person wearing the same color top walks past another point then we can make some probabilistic assumptions about their movement in between these points 
So by using um, machine learning and inference techniques, we can learn a lot about people which is not explicitly represented within the data set. And I think that this, these are the sorts of areas where we're going to see um, the possibility for abuse. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely can see your point. Um, we do have a couple, uh, we have five minutes more for questions and I can see the comments in the chat. Uh, there's um, uh, excellent talk, much food for thought, exactly my thoughts as well. And then there's a question about uh, specifically the CyRoc. Um, uh, how do how do people join this? Uh, is it for PhD students, for, 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 for master students? Do they have to be from uh, UWE and University of Bristol? Or is it open for, uh, for, for others as well? Mm, yeah. So um, unfortunately, the, the time to take part in the uh, event this September is, I would say it's passed, but it might be that we can reopen the opportunity. Um, we've publicized the event through a variety of different methods. Um, if you're interested, if, if there are um, audience members who are interested in, the, in this sort of thing, then I would strongly recommend that you join the EU robotics mailing list, which is a, an excellent source of information about this sort of thing. Um, and we've also promoted it throughout um, universities in the UK. Um, so if you want to if you want to participate, what I suggest you do is um, uh, go onto the website and uh, get in touch with us as soon as possible. Um, I mean, formally, our process of applying uh, and registering an expression of interest um, and then formally registering uh, has closed. Um, but uh, I will discuss with my colleagues whether we might be able to um, invite a few more teams. Um, one of the things which is going to be interesting about this year's event is the challenges around um, COVID travel restrictions. So at the moment, um, our uh, our understanding is that if you were going to Italy, uh, you'd have to self-isolate when you got there for five days, because. Uh, but that would be if you were going for touristic reasons. But if you're going for business purposes, you can spend 120 hours in Italy um, before leaving. Now that may change, um, but that's the situation at the moment. So what we're doing is we're mitigating against this risk by also um, providing for uh, a remote participation. And this will be very interesting because as far as we're aware, this will be the first remote benchmarking of robots, which has been attempted and, and reported on in the world. That's great. Uh, I'm glad I think this should clear it up and I hope uh, there's a question about a similar question, but uh, for a PhD student at Sheffield Hallam University, and I think that probably has answered it. So if I move on, we have a new question which reads, do you have any thoughts on the ethics of Neuralink, Elon Musk's attempt at creating a direct link between human brains and robotics and data? Yes, I have lots of thoughts about that. Um, so obviously there's, you know, this, this, this research goes back a long time. I remember being uh, very excited at uh, a conference in Edinburgh in the early part of the, well, I think it must have been about 2003, 2004, um, at uh, some research which was reported there on um, using neural links in monkeys in in order to support them playing video games. So this, the possibility of using um, these technologies to bridge gaps between the brain and the body are tremendously useful, um, both in terms of people uh, regaining control of their body after it, after injury or of um, controlling exoskeletons. Um, now, there's a whole bunch of other possibilities which people have talked about in the media about um, uh, you know the direct recording and replay of um, of conscious experience. Um, of uh, essentially having being plugged into Google or being plugged into the internet 
so that you know facts um, without directly interfacing with technology. I'm not a neuroscientist, but I would imagine that uh, the technology which is being described at the moment, which has you know a discrete array of tiny electrodes placed into the, the, the cortex of the brain, um, would not be suitable for this. Uh, how do we bridge the gap? How do we bridge the gap between externally represented semantics and internal representation? Um, so I think there's a lot of the claims around this which I find dubious. Um, and that's not to say which that they couldn't be realized in the end. Um, now, as to the ethical case for this, there is some discussion, of course, about um, whether we might create two different classes of human, those which have this augmentation and those which don't, um, and what that would mean. Should such technologies, if they're developed, be available to everybody or, or only to people who can afford them? Is it moral that there should be some people who enjoy a technology and other people who don't? Well, at the moment, we already have people who enjoy the uh, informational advantages of going to a library or using the internet. And this is largely dependent upon both their personal wealth and the accident of their birth in a particular culture or a particular part of the world. So I don't think that there's a, a particularly different ethical challenge there. Um, but um, in, in terms of equity, it would be good if we could make these things available to everybody. Yes. That's a, that's a great uh, line to close with and really matches your theme of inclusivity that you were mentioning at the end of your talk. So I think with that, we will have to thank you because we're running out of time. Fascinating talks. And thank you very much for showing us some of your work. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. And thank you out there in Internet Land. Cheers. So thank you, everyone. So we, now we're going to go into a 15 minute break. Uh, we're back at 11 um, in a different link that you will find, of course, in the program uh, with uh, a talk from Chen Kuan Yang. Okay, so have a break and see you in 15 minutes.